Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Angela Lortz. She is the co-founder and co-director of Action, which is a national collaborative learning network that conducts research around heart failure among pediatric patients. Angie, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast today. Thank you, Katie. So we've had the opportunity to work together a little bit. Can you tell us more about yourself? Tell me about uh, your work at Cincinnati Children's and Action. Yes, of course. So I am a cardiac intensivist. So I trained in pediatrics, cardiology, and ICU care. And then uh, seven years ago or so, I became very interested in advanced heart failure in children and specifically how they're supported with um, different devices. Uh, So medical management, but also different devices that are available to them. And so for the last seven or so years, I've been um, running the ventricular assist device program and artificial heart program in at Cincinnati Children's for pediatrics and adult congenital heart disease patients. And with that became, um, that's how I became interested in starting action. And action, why was action formed? Why was it necessary? Pediatric heart failure care is very different than adult heart failure care. Heart failure care in the adult world is very advanced. Lots of medications are being studied. Um, Devices are being made for adult heart failure. Obviously, it's one of the number one killers for adult um, patients. But for pediatrics, we have not had great therapies for children with heart failure. So what we usually do is we do we follow along in the adult's footsteps, and so we use adult medicine um, to care for our children. But we don't have any studies. There's usually not clinical trials, and the reason for that is because there's not enough um, children to study, or the children are also so um, very they vary so much in size and etiology of their heart failure. And so what we end up doing for these children is we, as I said, we kind of extrapolate data from the adult field and then um, for medications and then also for devices. So if a child has end-stage heart failure and they don't have enough blood going out to their body, um, they may get an adult device, which is made for an adult-sized patient. And it will be put in a really um, kind of innovative fashion surgically where we try to fit these larger devices into children. Um, So it is a disserviced um, patient population, uh, which is really why we started Action, um, because we felt like this patient population wasn't wasn't getting enough um, attention. Absolutely. So really one health system in one region won't see very many patients with with these types of problems, right? And so it was critical to create a larger collaboration uh, consortium around uh, this particular area of medicine. Right. So really, VAD therapy for kids only ramped up in the last um, five to seven years. And so what we found ourselves doing is calling each other um, in the middle of the night, different centers, because your our experience alone was so um, limited. Some some centers only do one device or take care of one end stage heart failure patient per year, and some centers take care of, you know, thirty kids that need devices. Um, so we really found ourselves relying on each other to learn more. And so instead of just having um, kind of random text messages and group texts, we decided, okay, well, let's collaborate together and figure out how we can do this in a better fashion. Um, That was the start of, or one of the reasons action started. The other thing that happened was about five years ago, um, we collected all the data on some of our babies that were on um, devices, and we found that the stroke rate was um, very high, and we wanted to make that better. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, something I know about action, thanks to uh, our our work at Untold and collaborating with you, is that it's grown rapidly over the last couple of years. Can you tell us more about, you know, we sort of heard about the the origin story of action. Can you tell us more about how you got buy-in at the health system level and then how it's taken off and why you think that that's been able to happen? 
Sure. So we started with five centers working together to decrease the stroke rates in these children. And so um, we were all just an invested group that really wanted to do this. And I'll, I'll never forget kind of the first meeting in 2017 where we had just a few providers, you know, sitting around trying to figure out what are we going to do to fix this problem. And then quickly people heard and were just as interested in fixing um, the issue. And so we are now at 40 centers two and a half years later. Um, we laugh sometimes and say we really didn't mean to grow that fast, but <laughs> we felt that every child in the United States and North America, actually, not to mean, mention we, don't have, we do have some international par- partners now, but mm-hmm. in North America should have the same care. And so what we felt very strongly is not to be ever exclude anybody. And so we kind of opened the doors to anyone who wanted to be involved. Um, and with that came a lot of responsibility for the centers and they stepped up to do it. So there was obviously um, money involved, but also there was lots of manpower. So yes. data collection and changing practice and data use agreements and IRBs and all of that came with it. And all the providers of these patients were very invested in making this happen. You know, in, in all of our research around innovation stories um, at Untold, one of the story patterns that we discovered was the innovation that emerges due to a recurring problem, something that's just feels unsolvable at the beginning, but through the perspiration and the commitment and the passion of the innovator, breakthrough can happen. And I think this is such a beautiful example of how that can happen through collaboration and thinking much more broadly than just uh, at the coworker level or even just the health system level. You're looking across, uh, you know, the globe and thinking, how can we pull together best practices and and work together to create innovation? And to me, that's, you know, the stories that are coming out of of action are so impactful because it's really changing the lives and the outcomes for for children and families. I think that's true. And I think one really great example I like to share is that so in normal academic medicine, we will um, write up a series of patients in pediatrics because we can't often do trials because we don't have the volume. Sure. Or we will um, try to share kind of anecdote and there's case studies and that kind of thing. And we, um, it takes us a long time to change practice because of that. With action, um, what we've done is using each other's experience and putting our data together we have been able to change practice very quickly. And so, as I said, we started this in 2017. In December of 2018, all United States um, children on the Berlin Heart, which is the only approved device for children, um, changed. we changed their anticoagulation from heparin, which is one drug, to another drug to bivalirudin. Um, that would never happen with traditional research. It would have taken too long, right? Yes, we always say that it takes 17 years, which I think there is some research to show. But we um, used everyone's anecdotal experience and put that together and did not necessarily wait for a podium presentation or a manuscript to get submitted and reviewed 100 times. Instead, we just put it together outside of the normal manuscript process to come up with a plan. Um, And with that plan, everyone was able to... um, talk through their own teams to do that and change, and the results have been um, really great. It's incredible. And I know that both of us are strong believers in the peer-reviewed process in terms yes. of, of why that's important. However, yes. in in terms of being able to innovate inside of healthcare, especially when the outcome is extremely dire and there's an urgency, I think that it sounds like that's one of the reasons why the research and the, the data and the the implementation you've been able to achieve has gone much more rapidly than what it could had you right. had to follow a very strict uh, kind right. of process. Well, and we laugh now because we say that it's just opposite of what we usually do, which is we usually pull all the data and do the peer-reviewed re- manuscripts, which is, as you said, very important, But and then we implement. And this time we pulled the data, implemented, and now we're getting the manuscripts out. Um, so it's just a little bit of a different timeline, but with the same um, rigor, to be honest. We, you know, we use the same... Um, manuscript process now and for what or how we did the rollout is we used quality improvement methodology and so we were able to really 
follow the data and we followed these kids very closely as we changed their anticoagulation to make sure they were having good outcomes. How has that change impacted outcomes? So in our last data set, we have a 50% decrease in stroke rates in the little kids that we have been caring for with ventricular assist devices. In the larger kids where we are also, we have improved stroke rates by a lot. Wow. It's, It's absolutely incredible. I would love to hear your perspective on why storytelling has mattered or what role it's played yeah. in the success of an organization like Action. So I think storytelling is really important to something like Action. And how you tell the story and the passion that you have behind it means a lot to everybody that signs on to be part of it. Um, I do think that the passion from the providers that as we talked through why we needed to do this, that passion was just, you know, poured out of these slide presentations that we were giving to Mm -hmm. people. Um, The other thing that we've really advocated for and is related to storytelling is that these devices that we're using are not labeled for children. So what happens is the adult devices go through the trial and they're for the adults, but then we put them in children. And so with that, we don't always have the same, um, clinical expertise from the industry and we don't have educational um, um, educational materials for kids. And so as we started to tell that story and say, how can we have devices for adults in the United States and we use those devices in children and we use them in the exact same fashion, but we aren't able to support them the same way and we don't have the same information and we don't have the same education. Um, How can that possibly be fair um, and as we told that story, that story really resonated with people and regulatory bodies, as well as industry, as well as parents, as well as providers. And so that's another thing that Action is really driving forward is how are we going to get these devices labeled to ch- for children to make sure that everyone is being treated equally and fair compared to when we don't have the numbers to do a randomized trial? That makes so much sense. And You know, I think there's a universality to our care for children. It's so instinctual for anyone, no matter whether it's your child um, who has that kind of diagnosis or uh, it's a child in your community or or just even hearing uh, you mention those numbers. I'm thinking of that particular child and those families and uh, the providers who I'm sure experienced so much heartache um, in the past before you started this collaborative and um, and really inspired everyone to to problem solve together. I think so. And we take, we often say, you know, we take every child home with us in some fashion. And so these children that we take care of, usually we're taking care of these children for a long time. We become very close to them and their families. Um, and when you're, when the child you're caring for has a stroke or has some adverse event or doesn't make it, um, every single time that happens with these providers, it just builds another, it's another brick that's built into why we need to work together and why we need to make sure that every stakeholder, parents, families, industry, FDA, everyone's working together to make it the best it could be. Absolutely. You know, when you're reporting on impacts, tell us about what language you're using to to tell those stories? Obviously, there's there are a lot of personal stories you could share, um, and I know you're also doing a lot of data collection and quality improvement uh, data collection as well. How do you share the impacts of action? I think that's a really good question, really hard to answer in medicine. I think the um, what we've been doing in the past before kind of rethinking things with action is that, you know, we do registry reports and we put out papers and they take years to put out. And I think that that is all very important. But what we're really trying to do in action is show impact more real time. And so trying to get that data on every kind of um, easily accessible way that we can get it to everybody so that parents and families are seeing, industry seeing, everyone's seeing that data um, quickly. And that's something that we're really working towards. And then how to visualize that data. We're not, we have not done a very good job in healthcare of data visualization, especially for patients and families compared to other fields or um, non-healthcare fields. Um, I think, you know, having patients and families and um, even payers looking through manuscript figures 
is very difficult to understand. Oh, definitely. I think showing the impact on a website with a really nice data visualization or a real-time data report showing over time how things have been changing is, is going to be really important to healthcare moving forward. Something I really respect about the action community is the way that you are thinking about audience and how to change the story, change the data that's presented, depending on which audience you need to inform or educate or inspire. Um, I know that when our team came to the action group uh, about six months ago, I think we did a data storytelling workshop together, and we really broke down, okay, who are the different audiences who might need to see uh, information and and research and be educated around the latest uh, insights on how to care for uh, patients in these conditions and also what do parents need to know and what what might a child need to know and how can you take one data point um, and share it across so many different types of audiences and I something I love about what your team in particular has a capacity for is that you you realize how important that is and you're thinking about um, how to communicate to a child versus a bedside nurse versus uh, a provider who really needs to um, be able to share with families and have those sort of talking points ready and, and for it to be consistent because that's another challenge is you're on the cutting edge of data collection in this field and so how do you Make sure that bedside staff are as up to date with their statistics and the information that they might convey to families as the um, intensivists would be. Right. And I think we are still struggling with that. What we talk about that almost every day is that sure. what we what we come to when we have those discussions a lot of times is that everyone needs to see data in a different way and um, it needs to be explained in a different way. But if you really think about it, the simplest way to display data is probably best for everybody. So despite the fact that we think we want more details as providers, I can tell you that having some really simple way to visualize that data within 30 seconds before I go into a patient room might be much more appealing to me. And I may know more about what I need to tell that family than trying to read a manuscript and figures at that moment. So although I think We do need to think through each patient population. I think no matter what we do, we need to make it as simple as possible Um, and maybe have it both ways. But um, simple data visualization, I think, is going to be really important to our field moving forward. Absolutely. I guess my my other question for you around that idea is what are some of the other challenges that you face within action and is storytelling a part of the solution in some ways? Yes. Um, storytelling is part of the solution. So one of the um, issues with moving um, healthcare forward and being more innovative in healthcare is there's a lot of concern regarding risk, and rightfully so, from either HIPAA, which is obviously very important to the legal manifestations of having innovation at your hospital, to data um, privacy issues, all of that you have to think through for every innovative idea that it that comes up. And so I do think that's a challenge to action. Um, and I think that storytelling is really important because no matter what legal entity you're dealing with that day that wants you not to do something um, or wants you to do it in a different way, I don't sure. want that to seem na- right. negative, but it's being, that's their job to be protective of mm-hmm. their institution. Storytelling to ha- pick up the phone and say to the legal counsel of that institution, we are trying to get devices to children. We are not you know, trying to disturb your data or disturb privacy. We want the FDA to have this data so that we can move this forward so that we can give kids the best care they can get. I think that storytelling of explaining what the innovation is doing, and it's not just a way to get some academic credibility or to promote yourself. It's a way to actually improve the care of children. Almost anyone that you get on the other side of the phone um, will try to work through whatever issue they're having. Um, So I have found that if, I I don't know if that fits with storytelling, but explaining the why is really important um, to being innovative in healthcare. Absolutely. And you have such an important 
it's really a mission critical why that that action is committed to addressing. So um, it's it's absolutely it sounds like part of the strategy there is making sure that there is empathy and understanding for the problem and what role yes. everyone is playing in the solution. Yes. Something else I really respect about action is that you've been really creative about how you educate patients and their families and and providers uh, because uh, most the, the everyday provider wouldn't typically um, have a patient with these you know types of uh, diagnoses and uh, treatment plans and so it's really critical to educate them and do do that in an engaging way and I love that you've used a lot of creative mediums and I think you're continuing to grow in that way but you've created a video game and an app you've uh, created animations and um, other educational materials and and um, in-person videos as well to to help bring uh, device utilization to life to help a child understand why am I getting this device and what is this going to feel like and to help families navigate different parts of their decision making. Um, I would love to hear from your perspective what creative mediums you think work best to engage families and providers. Well, I think it's it's interesting to watch. We really became interested in this education piece, watching these children who are now on some life-saving device um, or going home on a life-saving device with battery, hooked up to batteries and having equipment with them. They are so good at taking care of their device. So they're used to playing video games. They're used to going to school and having their iPads. They're used to doing, there's some schools um, that everything is done on an iPad or a computer. And so they're very used to that. And so you hand them a book and they start basically laughing at you when you hand them a binder of papers. (laughs) And they look at you like, why would we ever, what are we going to do with this? Um, And so it was really, it's eye-opening to see them look at you that way that we really need to get with it and have a digital transformation of how we educate patients, especially adolescent kids. And, you know, as we thought about it more, we're like, there's really not that many patient populations that wouldn't better have something on their phone um, to be educated than taking a binder home that is, you know, 10 pounds of paper. And so the more we thought about it, we thought, you know, let's just do everything electronic and let's try to do everything we can as an animation. Um, We focused all of our educational equipment or educational materials on more of a younger age group, knowing that everyone should like them that way. Mm -hmm. Um, And when people ask us, are these only for children? We always say no. We say these are for the parents who are stressed. And the last thing they want to do is see some really serious video if they can see an animated video talking about what their their child's going to go through and what the risks are, at least it's a little bit softer. Um, sure. So we really did try to um, make something that was seems to be for school age kids, but we are going to try to use it in even our adult or adult congenital heart disease patients. And there is some company interest of using it in their adult populations as well. There is growing research in the medical field around the role that animation in particular can play in patient education, helping them retain information and um, comprehend it and then follow through on discharge instructions. Um, It started with, you know, audiovisual experiments, seeing how could a patient learn more from a cartoon than from written discharge instructions. And I think now we're starting to see more and more studies around um, audio and visual or multimodal uh, elements inside of patient education, and there's so much potential there. You know, we see it in in other industries where uh, animations being used as a form of of educating, and it's a more memorable, uh, you know, way to convey information. And especially when you think of the stress that any hospital experience creates, let alone uh, an incredibly you know life critical kind of um, experience how much uh, that could lower stress and help people feel uh, like the information is understandable, that they can act upon it, that there's, you know, the next step that they can take without having to worry about all of the million steps and questions that they have. Right. And we are really trying to use infographics to their, to their best. Um, I think one of the reasons is I 
love infographics for myself. Like if I can look at something for 10 seconds and retain something on that infographic and walk away from it. And so teaching with infographics is something that we've been very um, interested in as well. So we have all the electronic um, files and animations and the video game, which shows how to change out your device. But also when we give data, trying to give it in little teeny pieces um, with a picture is something that we're really working on. Um, we have a long ways to go to change how we educate patients with heart failure, but I think we're getting somewhere. Absolutely. As we wrap up, I want to ask you one more question, and it's really more of an inspiring question. What advice would you give to other innovators, especially those in medicine, as they prepare to share and amplify really good ideas? So um, I, you know, having thought about this before, thinking through what I've learned is that innovation really can't happen if you're trying to be perfect. Um, oftentimes, we'll try something and take a risk, and I think you have to take a risk. Um, if you're trying to innovate, you can't make every I dotted and every T crossed right there when you, you know, roll it out. You may have to try something, and it may fail, and you have to try again. Um, but I really do think that in medicine, we have been we're so used to trying to make everything perfect because any any mistake in medicine or clinical mm -hmm. care could be life-threatening. So we are perfectionists and that is mm -hmm. our, what we are built to be. And so it's taken us out of our comfort zone to say, okay, so now innovate and make this video game for kids to figure out how to do their controller. Well, of course you want it to be perfect, but you don't even know if anyone's going to like it. So I think that that is really important to healthcare or at least physicians to remember that if it's not a life and death scenario and you're trying to innovate, it may be worth, you know, rolling something out with a risk. Absolutely. Thinking about failure narratives and, you know, the role that failure plays in the innovation process, the mm -hmm. stakes are so high in medicine. Um, but, and yet we won't learn rapidly if we aren't to some degree, willing to fail or have to tweak, you know, our solutions as we go. Right. Right. No, that is true. And for children with heart failure, there's not always great solutions to how to care for them. And so um, using all of the data that you have and all of the advice you can get from everyone in the collaborative to make the best decision possible, it sometimes is an innovative decision, but the alternative is just um, is not an alternative that you want to take on. You want to try. So whether it's in care of the child versus teaching them in a different way versus taking the using the data in an innovative fashion to get a device labeled, every everything we do, we have to think through. You know, we're in this situation. What what can we do? What's the we're going to take a risk. It may not be the perfect the perfect decision, but we have to take a risk. Absolutely. And to me, the, the most beautiful part of what you and the action community have created is conversation. You have connected to each other. You're sharing data. You're sharing insights. You're there for one another. Whereas in the past, all of those decisions were happening in such a siloed way. And you've completely transformed that through the innovation of of action and and having it continue to grow. I I wish for its continued success. Angie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me, Katie. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.